Well, good morning. If you'll turn to Revelation chapter 1, that's where we're going to begin this morning, in Revelation chapter 1, as we talk about why it matters that Jesus is God. <clears throat> in our Bible class, we've been talking some about how to speak in love, uh, but also in truth to those who are Jehovah's Witnesses and to those who are Mormons. And one of the most disturbing things about their teachings is that they have changed, essentially, tried to change the nature of Jesus. Instead of seeing Jesus as God, the Creator, they see Him as a created being. The Mormons believe that Jesus is Satan's brother, and the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. And this morning, I want to show you a great way that we can establish with absolute certainty that Jesus was not a created being, but that he was indeed God in the flesh. And then I want to talk about why this even matters. So in the video that I had you all watch for the Bible class, um, Mike Winger was the one who made the video. He talked about several ways to prove the deity of Christ. There's lots of ways to do this. He talked about you could go to Psalm 102, which is addressed to Yahweh or Jehovah, and then jump to Hebrews 1 and show that the Hebrew writer says Psalm 102 is actually about Jesus. You could go to Isaiah 6 and talk about this glorious vision of God that Isaiah saw, and then turn to John 12 and see that John says the glory that Isaiah saw back there in Isaiah 6 was actually Jesus' glory. You can go to John chapter 1 and show that Jesus was God that way as well. Um, what I would like to do this morning is to share my favorite way of showing this to someone. And what I like about this approach is that you can actually use the Jehovah's Witnesses' own Bible, the New World Translation, in order to do this. So if you're in Revelation 1, look with me in verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, if you ask a Jehovah's Witness, who is this referring to? Well, they would say Jehovah, especially since their translation here says Jehovah God and not Lord God. And they're absolutely right about that. This is Jehovah. This is Yahweh. Uh, so just a quick note here, and this is a, a little bit of a simplified way of understanding it, but this is the basic gist. When God mentioned his personal name to Moses, he called himself I Am. That is his name. In Hebrew, it is spelled Y-H-W-H. -H. Now, that's weird for us because there's no vowels in that. And so when, if you look at the word Y-H-W-H -H to try to pronounce God's name, well, kind of the best you can do without having any vowels to work with is just kind of say like Yahweh, Yahweh. You know, so that, that's where you get Yahweh from. But then later on, when vowels were added to God's name, it was Yehovah. And another way of saying that is Jehovah. So Yahweh, Jehovah, same way of talking about God, the one true God, His proper name, I Am. And this verse is indeed about Yahweh. It is about the great I am. And notice his attributes here in this verse are eternal. It says he is presently. He always has been and always will be. The phrase alpha and omega is actually the Greek way of saying the first and the last because alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet and omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So if this were written to us today, God would be identifying himself as the A and the Z. Describing God as first and last is another way of describing his eternal nature. He is not created. He is eternal. And it, this language also comes straight from the Old Testament. So hold your place here in Revelation. We'll be right back. Look with me real quick in Isaiah 44. In Isaiah 44, <clears throat> at the way Yahweh is described here in Isaiah 44, In verse 6, Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, now your Bible is probably capitalized there. Anytime you see Lord in all caps, that's his proper name. That's Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, thus says Jehovah. The King of Israel and his Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. 
So first and the last clearly refers to the Almighty God or Jehovah. Now, you can ask a Jehovah's Witness, do you think it would be appropriate to refer to anyone else as the first and the last? And they would say no. And you would understand why they would say that, because you can't really have two firsts and two last. Right? There can only really be one first and last. So now go back to Revelation 1. And let's continue reading down in verse 12, Revelation 1, 12 through 16. Because John has another vision here. And in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to, uh, to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were like... Uh, were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Now pause here, because you can now ask, okay, who is John describing here? And Jehovah's Witnesses would rightly say Jesus, because in verse 13, this this being is described as the Son of Man. And they know that's a reference to Jesus from the Old Testament back in Daniel chapter 7. They would be absolutely right. John is seeing a vision of Jesus here. But now watch what happens in the next two verses. This is just amazing. Verses 17 and 18. When I saw him, who? The person he saw the vision of, Jesus. I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Jesus calls himself the first and the last here. And if there were... You somehow got an objection to say, oh, no, 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 it's, it's talking about Jehovah again here. Well, that's impossible grammatically. But even if you somehow granted that argument, the question is, when was God dead? Because the text says, I was dead. The first and the last was dead at some point. When did that happen? It happened when Jesus died, because he is God himself in the flesh. And if they want to try to say, okay, well, maybe, maybe Alpha and Omega from verse 8, well, that references Jehovah. But then this other phrase, first and the last, well, that can reference Jesus. You can't get away with that either. Because you can prove that those two phrases are synonymous. Look in Revelation 22. Revelation 22 and verse 13. We already know it's synonymous, by the way, because in Isaiah 44, God calls himself the first and the last. In Revelation 1, he calls himself the Alpha and Omega. So this is synonymous. But you can show this from the book of Revelation itself. In Revelation 22, look in verses 12 and 13. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So here, those two phrases are used together synonymously because they are exactly the same. And now maybe you could wonder, well, who, who is this talking about? Who's verse 13 talking about? Well, if they say that this verse refers to Jesus, then they have to admit Jesus is Jehovah, since Jehovah is also called the Alpha and Omega back in chapter 1. But if they say, no, this isn't talking about Jesus, this is talking about Jehovah, they, they still have to admit that Jesus is Jehovah because Jesus is also called the first and the last back in chapter 1. So Jesus is called Alpha and Omega, first and last, just like Jehovah is. There is absolutely no way around this. But the question is, why does this matter? What does it matter if Jesus is God or if he's just a created being or some lesser God, like the Mormons say? Well, let me assure you, the reason this matters is not so that we can win arguments with Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. That is not the point. It matters because the nature of Jesus has a direct impact on our souls. And I want to point that out to you just in two ways. I could make many points about this, but we'll just look at two this morning. First of all, because worship belongs to God alone. 
One of the most egregious and really oft-repeated sins in all of Scripture is idolatry. In idolatry, really, if you boil it down, is man is worshiping the created rather than the creator. Happens all throughout Scripture. One of the things God, God detests. Romans chapter 1 gives us a stay in Revelation, because we're, we're going to be here in Revelation 22 in a second. But Romans chapter 1 gives us a history of idolatry among the Gentiles. And it says in verse 25, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And so look now in Revelation 22, if you're, hopefully you're still there. Look back in verses 8 and 9. I, John, verse 8, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. Even when John tried to worship an angel, the angel said, you get up right now. You nev never worship an angel. Worship belongs only to God, the Creator. And here's what that means practically this morning. If Jesus is just a created being, we are worshiping the created rather than the Creator when we take the Lord's Supper. That is sinful and would be tremendously detrimental to our souls. Only God is worthy of worship, which is why, by the way, during Jesus' ministry, he allowed people to worship him. He didn't say like the angel, no, 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 you know, get up, don't worship me. Jesus accepted worship from people because he's not a created being. He is the creator to whom our worship is due. And secondly, this morning, salvation comes from God alone. Salvation comes from God alone. It is true. God has always used human agents throughout history to accomplish his purposes. He sent, uh, you know, he used Noah, right, to save his family with the ark. He sent Moses in to be an instrument of salvation to the Israelites out of Egypt. He used David and Hezekiah and Nehemiah and Ezra. But the overarching message of the entire Old Testament is that even God's human agents of salvation have sinned themselves, and they too need saving. And so God himself promised one day that he would come personally and save us. So just a couple of verses I'll read to you quickly. Isaiah 40, verses 10 and 11. Behold, Jehovah God will come with might. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. Isaiah 40, verse 3, a voice is calling, Clear the way for Jehovah in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Now, what's amazing is Isaiah 40, that's a direct prophecy of John the Baptist, who was indeed a voice crying out in the wilderness to clear a path for Jehovah to come to his people. And after John finishes clearing that path for Jehovah, who comes? Jesus. Jesus shows up because he is Jehovah, the one John was preparing the way for. You see, God wasn't going to use a mere human being or even an angel to save us, but he was going to put on flesh, come here himself to save us. And if you think about it, that's really the only way this could have happened for two reasons. One, our sins are ultimately all against God, so only God can forgive us. The Jews knew this, which is why they were so mad when Jesus said he had authority to forgive sins. Because Jews, they recognize the only person who can forgive sins is the one who has been sinned against, which is God. <laughs> and this is what Jesus was trying to tell them. Yes, I know that. <laughs> And that's why I have, forgive, I have the authority to forgive you, because I'm God. And ultimately, all of our sins are also against Jesus and against the Holy Spirit, just as much as they are against the Father. And so, yes, Jesus could forgive our sins. He's not some angel or human being or some lesser God that we never sinned against. He is the God whose wrath we incurred and the God who came to save us from that wrath because of his great love for us. And finally, this morning, 
the reason salvation only comes from God is because only the death of God could atone for the sins of all of humanity. How in the world is it possible for the death of one man to be powerful enough to atone for the sins of all human beings that have ever lived? You know, you'd think you would have to take account of how, I don't know how many human beings have ever lived, billions, I don't know, maybe hundreds of billions if you counted them all up over time. And you'd think, well, you'd have to offer the same amount of sacrifices, right? Or at least one sacrifice per person uh, to forgive them of their sins. But yet, with Jesus' sacrifice, it covers all of our sins, the sins of every human being to ever live all the way back to Adam. Do we really think the death of an angel could accomplish that? Or the death of some other lesser God? No, only the blood of the one true God could have that kind of power. And I'll finish by reading Romans 5.15. If by the transgression of the one man, Adam, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, and let me say this another way, as we partake of the supper this morning, given to us by the Lord, let's remember it matters that Jesus is God, because worship belongs to him alone, and only he had the power to save us.